Dr. Delgado, can you hear me? I can't hear you fine. All righty. That was easy. <laughs> we got you in. <laughs> yeah. Like I say, most of the time, remember that if I tell you yes to something, I block my schedule. Well, I so, appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah. So that way I won't have any issues because otherwise somebody will take it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I cannot afford to leave anything open. You know, I we were me and Ken were having some issues the last couple of weeks. I think I got it resolved this time, but we the chat feature. I'm I'm gonna test it out here right now. See if you can see it. Hey guys, appreciate you appreciate you joining okay. early, Doctor Olson, Kay, Ron. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be starting here in about five minutes, and. Uh, <clears throat> If one of you guys can chime in, I, I last week we were having an issue with the chat. Um, I went ahead and sent a message, see if you guys can see that and or respond. Nice, nice. It looks like it's working. Perfect, perfect. Technology, let me tell you. <laughs> I tell you, I used to, I learned how to program using machine language. And I was able to, all of this software that you see, I was able to get in, break them down, and reprogram to do what I wanted to. Right. I cannot keep up with that anymore. <laughs> it's, I'll tell you what, I was going through the Zoom settings, and I, I swear there's about 50 different things you can turn on and off. <laughs> and, of course, I had the chat feature. Uh, when I had it set last week, it was only it was the only people that could see chat, I guess, was the host and the panelists. I had to switch it off, obviously, but it looks like we got it situated this time, which that's great. So, yeah, yeah, I'm still not used to it. I prefer to talk with the people face to face uh, right. because that way I can connect. I can look at everybody. So this is still new for me. Right. Hey, can you see me? By the way, I just uh, just started my video up and uh, went ahead and and got the uh, presentation on the screen as well. Can you see my face and can you see the presentation? I can see your face, my face, and the presentation. Perfect, perfect. So, for those of you that are joining in, uh, you guys are in for a special treat today. We have our very own founder of Epi Compliance on today's call, Dr. Jose Delgado. Uh, we're going to be talking about business associate agreements uh, here in the next couple minutes. We'll, we'll we'll wait here for another few minutes to get started. And Dr. Olson, I'm, I'm glad to see that you you made it in on this one. I know you're you're having some issues on the last one. Glad to see you in here, Dr. Olson. By the way, Dr. Delgado is a uh, legally mind customer and uh oh, great. <laughs> he's been trying to get in on these webinars so I'm, I'm i'm happy to see him uh on here today left us yeah. a really nice review on our uh, g2 profile as well we we appreciate that feedback nice well legally mine is actually i was the one that brought it to ap or brought ap to legally mine and i'll tell you it's one of the best services available out there Absolutely. It, it just, uh, you know, with uh, all the tax savings, you know, let alone uh, any sort of uh, malpractice, uh, you know, lawsuits would occur. They're there to help. And obviously, uh, our services are included as well. It's a win-win. Right. <laughs> well, for me, the attestation is I'm one of the clients for Legally Mind. Right. Right. And I'm very happy. And my wife was the one that jumped on it and said, you got to sign for it. <laughs> so that also tells you how important it is. If the wife approve, everything is fine. <laughs> Absolutely. So we got about one minute and we'll get it, we'll get her going. Yeah. Uh do you want me to give them while we're waiting with 135? Now I was gonna say if you wanted me to give them a little bit of a background. I was going to say, I kind of um, have something for you. And if you want to elaborate on what I say, let's do okay, that. that. Go ahead. That works for me. Cool. Well, it's one thirty-five, so we'll go ahead and get it going. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for yet another edition of our Compliance Step-by-Step -step webinars. Uh, my name is Ray Walters, and I will be your host. 
And uh, I'm absolutely thrilled today to be co-hosting this episode with our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Jose Delgado. He's our very own founder of Epi Compliance. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Delgado has over 25 years of experience in healthcare consulting and is recognized as one of the most experienced healthcare executives uh, globally. Uh, he has a diverse background, including uh, work in the Air Force Space and Missile Program. Uh, Dr. Delgado has successfully led various clinics, including rehab centers, uh, IT companies, uh, managed service organizations, demonstrating expertise in healthcare compliance, uh, IT development, and even federal uh, contracting. Um, Dr. Delgado, hope I didn't butcher that, but uh, if you want, if there's anything that I may have left out, which I know I have, uh, please feel share, uh, please feel free to share with the audience. The only thing I want to share with them is the fact that we are here because number one, we care about our patients, and number two, by us working together, we can actually help others that are actually seeing patients, so that we can get their backs. When I was in the military, there was a phrase that we used to say is, go ahead, I got your back. So what I wanted to see is that with services like Epic Compliance and Legally Mind is, go ahead, we got your back. And if you have a questions, come back to us. Uh, the one thing that you mentioned briefly that is very important for this uh, presentation is the fact that I'm still, one of my company is a federal contractor. So I personally have been one of the persons that do the audit for Medicare. And actually I have also been contracted by the federal government to do presentations regarding different aspects of the law, uh, HIPAA, EMRs, meaningful use, and all of these new laws. The important fact here is that what that means is that two to three years ahead of anybody seeing what the federal government is doing, I received the proposals about what is it that they want to do to see if we are interested in doing it. What that does uh, from the standpoint of AP compliance and the services we offer is that it helps us prepare our clients so that by the time that they award that contract and they have somebody already auditing or checking into that, we have already worked on that for years. So that that gives us that little bit of a heads up. I normally don't take a contract that is detrimental to our potential clients, but it's always good to keep an eye and ears on what are they doing, where is it coming from, and where are they going. So that's something that I hope to be able to provide during this and all the presentations. No, absolutely. And uh, obviously, today's topic, we're going to be discussing the intricacies of uh, HIPAA security and obviously the critical role of business associate agreements. Uh, obviously play a big role in uh, building and maintaining uh, trust within the healthcare sector. And uh, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, uh, obviously, and Dr. Delgado, I know you're you're new to this, but we always have a little bit of a show and tell of you know what we do here at Epi Compliance. I know you sort of mentioned a little bit, um, but uh, Epi Compliance, we were established in 2013 by leading healthcare professionals. Um, Epi Compliance has been the forefront of developing compliance training for healthcare organizations, uh, healthcare students, and business associates alike. Uh, Dr. Delgado is also the founder of Epi Conferences, um, where we offer a certified HIPAA security officer training uh, program. And uh, I've mentioned this before in previous webinars, but this is a training that we're going to be offering here online very soon, uh, as of right now, strictly in person. Uh, but Dr. Delgado, I was wondering if you can elaborate just a little bit more on that certified HIPAA security officer training program. I, you know, I know you've created it, but uh, let, let the audience uh, uh, give the audience a little more detail in, in, in terms of the importance behind that training. Okay. Uh, HIPAA security is recognized to be to the point that nobody can be in compliance 100%. HIPAA security is one of the few laws that it specifies what is it that you have to do in order to be in compliance with them. And it have identified over 27 to 35 different items that we have to do, regardless of the size of company, we have to do it. The sad part is that it also has to be done by business associates. Uh, under one of the laws, the high tech law, was where they started saying, well, business associates have to comply with HIPAA, some, some of the items from HIPAA privacy and all of the items of HIPAA security. Now, the problem is that it's so complex that most people don't know what to do. So, what I did was I created three levels of certifications. 
The first level, the HIPAA security officer, is basically one individual that every organization by law must have, but very few have been trained in terms of what to do. This is basically about 27 courses online, and then we offer a bootcamp that is eight hours, and a test is pass or fail, but I believe that the first version of the test was 200 questions. I think that the final version ended up to be about 100, and we have like an 80% pass rate. Uh, now, this is very important because I have people that say, I know this thing, I'm gonna take the test and I'm gonna pass it and move on. Well, I'm sorry, this is not a certificate you get into a, a I would say a serial box. I really want to make sure that the people that we certify know what they have to do. Now, there's a second level that is a HIPAA security administrator. That's more for uh, practices that may have two or three locations, may site businesses up to 10 different uh, locations. That's for that. So that means that that administrator must have a security officer and then be the administrator. Nobody can actually go and take the administrator test without first passing the security officer. Then the third level is the HIPAA security uh, executive. That is for multi-million dollar corporations, hospital networks, and this is extremely difficult because it's basically essays. We're gonna present situations and they have to tell us what are the variables that they have to look into it, what will be the resulting actions to solve the problem. And then based on that is that we will evaluate whether they have met the requirements to pass on. So I will basically encourage everybody to at least uh, in every organization have one, and actually I recommend two or three, depending on the size. Uh, it's challenging. Every building that even takes just a boot camp says so that at the end of the day, they feel like they have been run by a truck and that they didn't know all of the little things that we're trying to teach. So it is supposed to be the first level. So I normally try to say simple, but nothing with HIPAA security is simple. No, it's not, and uh, especially to you know today's topic uh, regarding business associates. So, um, thank you for the for for giving the details on that. And as mentioned, uh, this is a training. The CHSO, uh, Doctor Delgado mentioned, there's three levels, but right now uh, we're working on level one, getting that one online as well for everybody to be able to to to, to digest and consume. Um, but Without further ado, let's let's talk about today's topic. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about business associates. So let's define some of our objectives today. Uh, we want to define and clarify the role of uh, business associate as per HIPAA rules. Uh, we want to emphasize the functions and activities performed by business associates in handling uh, protected health information or PHI. Uh, we want to stress the uh, crucial importance of business associate agreements uh, between covered entities and business associates. And then last but not least, we want to outline how these agreements contribute uh, to safeguarding PHI. And obviously, we want to mitigate any legal liabilities. So um, let's get started. So what is a business associate? So Dr. Delgado, I want to make this sort of uh, uh Obviously, you being the uh, expert here, I want to sort of interview you on each of these slides. Um, so, Dr. Delgado, can you elaborate further on what exactly constitutes a business associate? Well, the first thing I have to say is thank you, because I hate to be killed by PowerPoint. If you were going to read the slides, no, 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 I no, was no. going to give you something else, well, you're because make this our audience can look at the slides later. Yes. Uh, but I can go into the information about each slide in a way that is useful for the audience because they are the reason why we're here. Absolutely. So the first thing, look at it in a simple way. And normally when I audit or even I try to help a business, I say, let's first look at all of your subcontractors. Who are the people you are paying to money to? Okay. And then from then I go to the next level. Okay. So these people are subcontractors. That's already determined. Then do they access your PHI, uh, which is the patient health information in any way or fashion? If they access the PHI or EPHI for any of their services, then they are a business associate. Now, some of the laws that passed recently 
uh, change a little bit that because they don't need to have access, direct access to EPHI in order to be considered business associate. For example, uh, for some of these farm companies, and a farm, I mean server farm, not farm well, produce and grocery farm, that they, because they maintain your server, it is basically uh, considered that they could have access to EPHI at any point in time. So they have been determined to be business associate. Now, the funny part with the uh, federal government is that if we were to use that, well, we say, oh, okay, so the ASPs, which are the big ones that provide us the, or ISP, internet service providers, should be business associates. Mm -hmm. But those are not considered to be business associates, internet service providers. So you gotta be careful because even the government in some of the settlements, they reserve the right to classify somebody as a business associate. For example, I will have corporations that have sister corporations that are working with them. And then I remember one case where they say, you have not determined whether they are part of the primary corporation or they are business associates. So based on that alone, there is a settlement for each one of these organizations, for every piece of information that they touch, that they have to pay a fine. So they basically say, we're gonna give you six months to decide how you're gonna correct that. And based on that, we're gonna determine what will be the fine that we're gonna impose on you. So I will basically say, in case of doubt, consider them business associate, get the business associate agreement. And normally I would say, make it, or use the one that we provide you in Epic, because there is some leeway, gray zones, where they can actually put some word in that could um, jeopardize your protections, okay? So basically, normally subcontractor mm -hmm. means somebody you pay to that actually have patient information. That's the simple definition. So to that point, Dr. Delgado, um, could you provide some more examples uh, to our audience to help them understand uh, in terms of who's considered a business associate? Um, here's the next slide. I listed some examples here, but maybe you can point out some of the common ones that you'll see in, a, in, in perhaps a healthcare organization or a practice. Yes. Uh, but with that, I also going to give you the answer to all the questions, which, you know, I always say in every conference, every time I, I speak with anybody, the answer it, is it, it depends. depends. <laughs> because, every time. Yeah. Let's say, for example, medical waste services. Well, yes. why should they be considered a business associate? I mean, if all they are doing is picking up biomedical waste, there's no patient information that should be considered part of HIPAA or protected information. But now if they had the labels, they had the litter bottles or any information that could identify a patient, then they become a business associate. Now, for example, janitors, cleaning people. Right. Cleaning people are not business associates because yes, they will have access, but that's kind of a secondary type of access. It's not part of their job to have access to that information. So like somebody come electrician comes to change a light bulb. Well, that's not a business associate. Now, IT depends. Let's say, for example, that you have an IT person that comes in just to fix your computer. But if he's only fixing the computers, he's not a business associate. But if he's actually also providing you backup services, that immediately makes him a business associate. For some companies that use software companies, well, developing the software doesn't make somebody a business associate. But once you have patient information and they start troubleshooting and trying to fix, now they are a business associate. Even from the standpoint of a provider, I had I managed over 60 offices, I have my own clinics. And depending on the relationship is whether even these providers are considered to be a business associate. So, for example, if they are my employees, and this is actually more based on IRS rules, they are my employees, they are not business associates. But if they are subcontractors, somebody that I pay a company, or even if they are their own company and I pay them, now they are business associates, and I need a business associate agreement. So that's why I say it's very tricky. 
Uh, I have even seen some companies that are not for profits, religious organizations, government organizations that have been caught in this, you know, the business associates. And I would say that business associate is the number two easiest way to get somebody and prove that they have violated HIPAA. The first one being the security risk analysis. I can go anywhere. And I will tell you that I pretty much am going to find something. And the first thing is going to be there. Sorry, I say you are not compliant. Once you're not compliant, one thing, all I got to look is how much is going to be defined. So business associate is my number two. Once I look at who are the subcontractors, then I start digging to see what is it that they do? What is it and what kind of access they have? And that is what it will tell me. Uh, for example, sometimes people say, well, my attorney is not. Well, it depends. Does attorney, your attorney deal with any kind of patient information? Then no. My my CPA. Well, again, if your CPA is actually looking at all the people that owes you money and you have patient information there, well, now guess what? He's a business associate. He's dealing with patient information. You're paying him to do certain things. So you got to be careful. So I would say basically, directly or indirectly, they may be. But most of the time, maintenance, cleaning people, they're not. I don't know if it was you that had mentioned this, but I, someone had mentioned, hey, when in doubt, if you're unsure if, if you need an agreement in place or not, just have have one in place anyways, right? It couldn't, yes. it couldn't hurt you. Um, yes. You know. Well, this is basically what happens is that you will never be fine by having an agreement that covers the business associate closest if you don't need it. It sure. never happens. Sure. Now, the opposite is true. So I say, I might as well. Now, most of the time, so contractors that know about it, they don't want to do it. IT companies, they hate it. And because number one, they don't understand it. Number two, when they start reading it, they don't want to assume that liability. Right. So, but yeah, my default is have them sign it, no matter how simple it is. No, I agree. I agree. And uh, so now that we have a, a better understanding of uh, a business associate, who's who's considered a business associate, um, can you tell our audience, uh, explain them a little bit more about the business associate agreement and why it's a critical component in the realm of healthcare compliance? Okay. The business associate is actually something that is covered both under HIPAA privacy and HIPAA security. On their HIPAA security, and when you look at the omnibus rule, the high tech ad, and all of the different, I would say, modifications or variations of those laws, all of them basically require that a business associate agreement be actually signed and in effect at the time. Now, for example, uh, some people I audited, I said, well, this had, person has been my business associate forever, and I have the agreement over here. Well, I'll tell you that immediately. When I look at that and I look at the date, if it's prior to 2013, that agreement is not valid anymore because of the omnibus rule. So they need a new one. Now, under omnibus rule, also something that happened that is very important is that this is the first one that not only actually created the, the business associate plus the business associate of the business associate and so on to no end, created that chain of events that we are primarily responsible for everybody down the chain. But also it basically say that we must obtain assurances that they are in compliance with HIPAA security. So I tell you as a business owner, a healthcare professional, I don't have the time to audit my business associates to see if they are in compliance with HIPAA security. Now, what the law states is we must obtain assurances, mm -hmm. but the law after that is very great. They don't specify what are the assurances that you must obtain to make sure that they are in compliance. So, so far, everything I have seen is that when a business associate is actually guilty of a breach, they're, they don't even look at whether you obtain uh, assurances to protect yourself. Uh, I never had one of those cases because if not, I will fight all the way to uh, Washington. But what are assurances? Uh, the first level that you need is to have a valid signed business associate agreement. If you don't have that, it's game over. You might as well start looking for your checkbook 
uh, for refinancing your house and to look for some kind of money because the fines are coming in. And sometimes it's six, seven figures come up very quickly. Uh, so this is serious. It's an easy way. And I hate to say this, but it's a fundraiser. I want to, I need a couple million dollars to pay for my department. Let me start doing this to the point that state DAs are actually trained on HIPAA security and how they can actually go ahead and go after clients themselves. And other agencies are also doing it because it's easy. Like I say, you don't have an SRA, you're done. You don't have a valid business associate agreement with each business associate, you're done. So at the very least, have a business associate. Under our system, I created something because I always want to go a step above and beyond. And it's basically a form, kind of a notarized form that we send to our business associate every year where we obtain assurances. Who's your HIPAA security officer? Who's your privacy officer? Have you conducted an SRA? Do you have policies and procedures? You train your people? They sign it. Now I have something signed. I say, yeah, I went ahead. And not only do I have an agreement, I went one step further. Sorry to so, cut you off, but what if uh, what if they refuse to sign that? Just curious. <laughs> well, the problem is that if they refuse to sign that, now you got a problem because that means is are they in compliance with HIPAA security? Exactly. Uh, now it's just a matter of when something happens, what are you gonna do? It's like I was uh, talking with Miss Leah the other day about what I say. Mm -hmm. You can actually practice medicine without a license. And depending on the place, they'll slap your hands, do a couple of warnings, fines, and let you go. Do the same with HIPAA security, and you will see that it's mandatory fines right there. And then when you go into the Department of Justice, there's actually potential their terms that you have to do it. So I don't play with this thing. If somebody, a business associate, tell me, I don't want to give you any of that, and I don't have it, or they just refuse, I'll start looking for another business associate. And if I have a couple of clients that are international, that they can only use these subcontractors, then at that point in time, what I do is I jump ahead and create a defense for them in case that they have to go to court to prove that we have done everything possible. But in this case, there's not even a possibility for us to continue operations without that person. So you got to be proactive. No, good point. And uh, I know you kind of touched on this already, but, um, you know, obviously, uh, to your point, you know, compliance is it, it's it's not just a suggestion. It's a mandate. Right. Um, could you shed a little more light on why business associate agreements are federally mandated? And uh, I know you've touched on this a little bit, but potential consequences of not having them in place. Yeah. Well, this is. Um... I, I mean, like you say, I already mentioned about this, and I could be right. talking about this thing with multiple examples about who is, who's not, and what will happen. I don't want to, I would say, bore you with this thing, because a lot of the times when I talk with a new client or uh, somebody asks me a question, I tell them, this is simple. Mm -hmm. If you don't do this thing, Again, you are already violating the law. So you are not even supposed to have a license to practice medicine. It's that simple. It is the law. It's a federal mandate. The problem is that it's not just HIPAA. There are multiple other laws that refer to the business associate relationship. Now, if you do that, and I have somebody that was uh, actually using a subcontractor from, from India. Now, this is interesting. Because at this point in time, people started asking me, well, what if I use somebody that is not from the United States? Is that legal or not? Can they, can I basically make them a business associate? So what the law says in terms of international subcontractors is that they, they say, we do not discriminate. From the federal mandate, it says, if they meet the business associate requirement, you need to have a business associate agreement and they must follow some parts of HIPAA privacy and all of HIPAA security. Whether the government can enforce it or not is the tricky part because the federal government is not gonna go after somebody in Brazil, Colombia, India, Pakistan. They are not gonna do that. 
but they're going to go after you. So guess what? That means that not only are you always responsible, now you're going to pay for everything they did. So it is to your benefit to make sure that you protect yourself at some point in time. Otherwise, again, it's Consider that not having a BAA is the same as practicing without a license. It's like basically selling drugs on a corner. I hate to say it that way, but selling drugs in a corner, you might actually get away with a slap <laughs> on the hand. With this one, the government doesn't give you any leeway. No, absolutely. They're it's federally mandated. Got to have them in place. And uh, actually, I... I, I believe I took some of these from a previous presentation of your Dr. Delgado, but if you don't recognize it, it's okay. <laughs> but I wanted to provide some real world examples. And uh, a lot of this information you can actually find off the Health and Human Services Department website. Um, this one in particular, $31,000 fine settlement for not having a business associate agreement in place with your a file fax, which is responsible for storing records containing patient, patient health information. So again, just wanted to share some real world, world uh, cases here. Again, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, um, but it's something so simple, right? Uh, um, and that's, and again, that this is a, these business associate agreements, that's something that uh, our EPI services that we provide as well. Um, another example I wanted to show as well, uh, uh, Advocate Healthcare uh, settles for five, and a half million dollars. I mean, that's, it's a lot of money. Right. Yes. And, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if they, did they go out of business or were they, they still, <laughs> um, I think they were still, uh, I think they had to lay off a lot of people. Um, yes, they actually just, did some corrections. Let's put it this way. Yeah. The thing is that when you look at it, once they get into those kind of penalty, it's not just the settlement. Yeah. is the corrective action plan. Right. And in every corrective action plan, I see that then they say, conduct an SRA, update your policies and procedures, make sure that all your business associate agreements are in place, train your people, and then they want a third party to be monitoring the organization and report to the Department of Health and Human Services to make sure they're in compliance. And they do that for a couple of years. So it's basically say, oh man. So now not only did you pay the fine, but you have big brother over your shoulder in your facility getting information to make sure you're doing it for years. And if you deviate in any way or fashion, you're done. So you're basically yeah. a target at that point. And yeah. uh, this was another interesting one too. This was a uh, Florida uh, based company, advanced care hospitalists, uh, again, had to pay $500,000, uh, um, for not having business associate agreements in place. And something I wanted to mention, uh, uh, how important is it to keep, uh, you know, obviously when you have these business associate agreements in place, and I'm just going to use, for, just for the sake of this, I'm going to use, uh, let's just say I have an agreement in place with my EMR company. And uh, I decide to uh, uh, go with a different EMR company, whether it's a better, uh, you know, just a better service overall or fits my needs better. What am I to do with that previous uh, business associate agreement? Do I just trash it or am I supposed to keep it? You know, under, and, uh, under HIPAA privacy, it basically states that you must keep all information regarding your compliance for six years. Okay. So even if you terminated that, you still have to keep it for six years. Now, if they, uh, and depending on what is the case, if the case goes to the Department of Justice, now you got to look at the statute of limitation. And the statute of limitations may vary based on whether you're talking about a patient that have a commercial insurance, a managed care insurance, or even whether they are children or not. Because then, in addition to HIPAA law, that is six years, then now the statute of limitation, depending on your state, depending on the patient, depending on the payer, kicks in. And that could be anywhere up to 16, 17, 18 years. Wow. Yeah, no, that's good information. I mean, a lot of our customers ask, you know, hey, if, uh, you know, if I'm no longer doing business with this business associate, do I keep these agreements on file? And obviously using our system, you have an archive method, you know, where you just, you hit the button, you archive it, it's going to stay on our system. 
Um, yeah. So, no, very important. And uh, and that kind of hits home here. Uh, uh, obviously, we sort of discussed the potential pitfalls. Uh, let's focus on the uh, the uh, solutions here. Um, and Dr. Delgado, maybe you can elaborate on each of these. And forgive me, you know what? I should have mentioned the SRA on here. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is important. Have. I should have mentioned it on here. But um, again, uh, uh, just four solutions uh, based on our, our conversation. Uh, implement uh, templates for business associate agreements. Again, this is something that Epi Compliance uh, can assist with. Uh, we have templates that clearly define and scope the responsibilities of the business associate. Dr. Delgado had mentioned mentioned this as well, but obtain assurances. Um, and I know we didn't really harp on this a whole lot, but obviously when it comes down to training, you want to make sure your staff is trained and educated in HIPAA uh, security, HIPAA privacy, uh, make sure all parties are involved and informed and up to date. Um, Dr. Delgado, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more on that. Well, I was looking at the time and I want to be respectful of our audience. Sure. Uh, so basically I would say if we're dealing about business associates, business associates only. So the first one will be the business associate agreement and the second one will be the assurances. And we actually have a module for business associates because it's important. Everything else is there, is the SRS, is the training for the employees. Even when you're talking about retention of documents, the policies and procedures for HIPAA have also need to be maintained for six years. But right now keeping it Business associate, business yes. associate agreement and assurances. I will keep it there for now. Great, great. And uh, guys, again, I appreciate your guys' participation. And yes, we are very mindful of your time. We do like to keep these within 20 minutes, but listen, Dr. Delgado was on here today. <laughs> I'm going to blame him for everything, but no, uh, 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 we wanted to make this, uh, this very insightful for you guys. Again, business associate, very important topic. And uh, uh, again, I do want to open up just for a brief FAQ. Those that can still hang around here might have some questions. But uh, uh, just real uh, quickly, again, uh, for those that are eager to advance their knowledge in career and compliance, uh, again, always suggest, uh, and again, Dr. Delgado, we've been doing uh, uh, these past several webinars, we've been talking about OSHA-related topics. So again, we always yeah. offer a free OSHA course uh, 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 via epicourses.com. Um, if you guys are looking for something a little more uh, 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 bundled or, you know, you're looking for not only just OSHA, but HIPAA as well, we do offer a, a Epi Compliance training bundle that includes all your HIPAA privacy, HIPAA security, OSHA for healthcare, and uh, waste, fraud, and abuse training. And then as far as the business associate agreements go, uh, we do have an all-inclusive platform as well. That is our Epi Compliance Pro Package. Um, that's not only just going to include all the training that I mentioned, but it includes all the policies, procedures, uh, all the templates, um, reminders, uh, and also uh, uh, online method for sending out business associate agreements. And we are providing those templates to you. Um, so uh, again, everybody's going to be receiving an email with a link to these uh, these products. Um, again, at the very least, uh, if you haven't taken your OSHA training or your staff hasn't taken the OSHA training this year, take advantage of our free service. Um, you get a, you take the course, you get a PDF downloadable uh, certificate at the end. And uh, well, without further ado, again, I appreciate your guys' time. Dr. Delgado, uh, appreciate your participation today um, and uh, hope to see you on future webinars. I think you're going to be on the one and sometime in December, yeah. um, but uh, uh, obviously looking forward to have you on, on more of these conversations. And uh, um, let's go ahead and open up for just a quick uh, FAQ, and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, good question. This is uh, from Anonymous. Um, is it required to uh, re-sign a business associate agreement annually? No. No. Unless the law changes in such a way that the terms of the contract will change, you don't have to do it. So as long as you have one, and I would say one from 2014 and on, that should be fine. No, good uh, Good question, good answer. That is a very common question that we get, I'd say, from customers. Um, let's see if we got any more uh, coming in here. Here's another one. Uh, Dr. Delgado, could you elaborate on specific challenges uh, that healthcare organizations commonly face in ensuring compliance with HIPAA security rules? Oh, Jesus. 
<laughs> I can actually talk about that for <laughs> a week. The main thing right now is that everything that we're doing is gearing into computers, technology. There is the internet of things now. It's another topic. So without us knowing, we're actually, not only our personal information, but also our business information is becoming available. Like for example, devices just like Alexa. And I laugh about that because uh, I will tell you a very brief about an attorney that had Alexa in his office to listen to music. And the minute I step in and I pointed out, you know that that's basically like an open channel that somebody is listening and collecting data. All of these companies are saying, no, 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 they are protected and they only uh, activate when you mention the name. Well, the problem is it depends on the accent. Tell me, I know about accents, okay? So there are times that they get triggered and they get activated. If not, think about when you're talking with somebody around some computer or technology uh, assistance, and guess what happens after that, that they you're gonna start getting ads. Let's say you're talking about a vacation in Italy and you're gonna get all kinds of ads about Italy. So we have put ourselves in the front of information being collected about us on an ongoing basis. So that's the problem because we look at the convenience, but we don't think about the security. And I would say not just HIPAA security, your personal security is important, okay? No, I think some of that actually kind of goes into uh, next week's topic as well. We're going to be talking about another HIPAA security related topic, but workstation use with cell phones and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can't tell you, you know, how, you know, I have friends that are physicians that are on their cell phones and they got their EMR app up and this and that. It's just it's it's crazy. It's going to be a fun topic to discuss. Uh, and and like you mentioned earlier, everything is, you know, on cell phones. It, uh, everything's there. And uh, well, like I say, now I say devices. Because the even devices, saying a yes. laptop, a computer, mm -hmm. all of that is all technology. There are so many devices around us. Our electricity, I mean, it's like I actually had a hard time with the pool maintenance because they wanted to connect my pool to the internet so I could turn the jacuzzi and control the lights and all that. I told them no because it was a security breach. The firewall yeah. on that device oh. to connect through the internet is nothing. So it's very easy to use that to get into my home network. And then from then they have a field day. So people don't understand That's all scary. of those conveniences will cost you dearly if you're not careful. No, good point. Good point. Well, hey, uh, again, Dr. Delgado, I appreciate your time being here. And everybody, again, we went a little over today, uh, but I, I hope you, you guys found this uh, presentation valuable. Um, plenty more where that came of. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about HIPAA security next Tuesday. Uh, again, same time, 1.35 p.m. Eastern Standard. And uh, we're going to we're going to talk about that and uh, some more HIPAA security topics here in the near future as well. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but everybody should be receiving an email from us uh, uh, with some of the links that we discussed. Um, obviously, if you guys have any questions, concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I, I, our main line numbers here. Also, you can reach out to info at EpiCompliance. Um, but uh, again, appreciate everybody's time and uh, we'll see you guys next week. OK, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Delgado. Okay.